The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you, and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God bold. The context of our passage today is the church has begun in Acts chapter 2, they obeyed the Lord and waited till they were endued with power. Peter preached his first recorded message in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he and John go to the temple to pray at 3 in the afternoon, the ninth hour of the day. And on their way, a lame man, 40 years old, who begged at that position at the main entrance to the temple regularly, was miraculously healed. A crowd gathers, and Peter preaches his 
second recorded message in Acts. And then he gets arrested for it. And the next morning, this is what our text gets into, Peter preaches his third recorded message in the book of Acts. It says, as they spoke to the people while they're preaching, this crowd's gathered around this healed lame man, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, all right, the religious authorities, the cultural big shots. They were greatly disturbed, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they were upset about two things, that Jesus was still alive, and this miracle was used to prove that, as well as that there is life after death. They laid hands on them, put them in custody. They arrested them until the next day, for it was already evening. So the commotion that erupted over this guy getting healed and then Peter preaching and 5,000 people now are in the church because a bunch of people became believers that day. Uh, the hours passed and it was getting dark. So the authorities said, we're going to deal with this, and they arrested him. Can you imagine going to a prayer meeting, a 3 o'clock prayer meeting, not getting out till the next, not getting home till the next day? How do you explain that to your spouse? Uh, they had some explaining to do. They laid hands on them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000 men. Now, this was shaken up things in Jerusalem. These people were all inhabitants of Jerusalem, and now here this church of 5,000 men has come into existence in just a matter of days and a few short weeks, and Jerusalem only has about 6,000 Pharisees. So this was shaken up the joint. Verse 5, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they took them out of the cell, and they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? Oh, they shouldn't have did that. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he left no doubt as to who uh, did this, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. And then he quotes a prophecy from Psalm 118. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. You guys have made a big boo-boo here. Nor is there, and he begins to, I believe, as the Holy Spirit brings things to him to say, he declares something that is a truth for all time to these Jewish leaders. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. So they knew these guys hadn't received formal training and they talked like hicks, I guess. But they had been trained by the best, the rabbi Jesus Seeing the man who'd been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, now how does Luke, who's writing this book, know what they said? Keep that question in mind. It'll be answered a little later. They said, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Boy, were these guys naive. Verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor to teach in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. But for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on which this miracle of healing had been performed. The whole city, if they went to the temple, knew about this guy. No doubt all of them at some point had given him money. And here he is healed, and the name of Jesus is being glorified. Being let go, verse 23, they, meaning Peter and John, went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. They told on them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. The basis of their prayer is declaring the greatness of God. Verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David have declared or have said, and they begin to quote from Psalm 2, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they're basing their prayer on the messianic prophecy of Psalm 2. At another time, uh, read Psalm 2. It's amazing what they're basing their prayer on. For truly, verse 27, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles... And the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your, pur- and your purpose determined before to be done. So God's not taken surprise by this. They're recognizing the sovereignty of God in the midst of their prayer. And they're not praying for the Lord to take away their problems. They're praying for the Lord to give them strength. Now, Lord, look on their threats. Can we say threats? Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. This was the fulfillment of Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Here we pray. Lord, I pray that your word would set up camp in our hearts and stay there. Lord, may our lives be changed every day by your word. Give us a hunger for your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'd like to speak to you today on how to face threats. Can we say that? Thank you for asking. Here's a great illustration of a bold chicken in the parking lot of KFC. Here's another one. They don't learn very quickly. How to face threats. Now, what I'm talking about is real threats. Some people are threatened because a neighbor got a better car than theirs or their yard looks better than theirs. That's an imagined threat. That's a perceived threat. That's not a real threat. Some people are threatened when uh, you go out and buy a new dress and you go somewhere and somebody else has on your dress. How dare they? That's not a threat. If that's your problem, if that's what upsets you, you need to get some real problems. You need to get busy for the kingdom of God. How to face threats. Remember what Jesus said about suffering. You know, he never promised us a rose garden. And if he did, guess what roses come with? Thorns. He told them in John 16, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. I'm telling you stuff so you don't get tripped up. I'm forewarning you so you don't get shook up. They will put you out of the synagogue. Now that sounds, oh, whoop de doo that's not a big deal to us, right? Put me out of your synagogue. But this was virtually being put out of business. This was being excommunicated from society. This was tough on Jewish believers. If you're denied access to the synagogue, you have a a 
big black mark against your name, and people won't give your business business. They will put you out of the synagogue. Just the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they've not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So here the pressure's mounting, the threats are beginning. And they're being reminded of what the Lord had told them. Verse 33 of the same chapter, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our Lord is a world overcomer, and he's made us to be more than conquerors through him. Threats are threats. Whether they're real or not, they're still threats. If they're sidetracking you, deal with them. And I hope this morning's message will help you deal with it. The threat of an, did you know the threat of an, an attack is actually an attack? Sometimes the attacks we go through are just threats of attacks, and they are attacks. They affect you just like the real thing. So the thing is to line ourselves up with the principles of God's word so that we are not sidetracked, so that we don't stumble, so that we don't lose our peace that is our portion in Jesus. Do not worry, but trust the Holy Spirit. The world says, don't worry, be happy. If you can do that, fine, in your own strength. But our command is, don't worry, but rely on the Holy Spirit. Jesus has said, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So here, Peter, a Jewish emissary of the Lord, speaks to the Jewish authorities, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, being inspired by God himself, says, there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's not another deal here. There's not another covenant. This is it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but might have everlasting life. That truth is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. May the Lord help us to rely on the Holy Spirit to remind us of these truths when confronted, when questioned, and when threatened. Don't worry. The Lord knows when a sparrow falls and he knows when you're under attack. When, he, when you're being threatened. Do not fear, but be filled with the Spirit. Why well, I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. Be filled. Pray till you're filled. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly spoke to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He addressed them again. He had addressed them the day before, boldly being filled with the Spirit. How full are you? Do you keep your tank full? Do you commune with the Lord often? Do you pray for God's power to help you to go through life? Or do you just try to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, depend on your own ingenuity and creativity and strength till you find yourself in a mess? Be filled with the Spirit. Those who are filled with the Spirit will be led by the Spirit. Don't forget the power of the good news. Paul wrote in in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Remember, I asked you earlier, how did they know what happened in that private meeting when Peter and John were asked to leave, told to leave, made to leave. Here's how they knew. In Acts chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So some of these very guys became believers, and they told what happened. It's part of their testimony. Yep, we threatened them, told them not to speak anymore in his name, but they still did it, and here I stand 
saying the same thing. Don't forget the power of the gospel. Don't forget the power of the gospel. Not pep talks, not booster shots. The gospel is the answer for everything. Jesus paid it all. Well, I've got some enemies. Well, he died for their sins. And if they will believe the gospel, they'll no longer be your enemies. You know, Judaism and Christianity, the Judeo-Christian faith, have one thing in common above all others, other than the same Messiah, just some don't know it. But the one thing they have in common is a command to remember. Remember the Lord your God. Remember his commands. Remember to obey him. Many times as believers, we forget what we're supposed to remember or we remember what we should forget. Remember. Many times we forget what we should remember and then we remember what we should forget. Remember what the Lord tells us to do. How to face threats. Don't isolate yourself from those who care. If you truly are threatened, don't, don't isolate yourself. Don't try to carry it on your own. Now, if it's this kind of threat I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, you know, if somebody has the same pair of shoes you have on and you want to run to somebody and say, can you believe she went out and copied me? How dare she? Or can you believe he got the same car we got? Can you believe he got the better model than I did? That's not a threat. That's fleshliness. And to do that and to run, you need to keep that between yourself and God. That'd be so in discord. Being let go, having really been threatened by the real deal, they went through to their own, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. They went and told on them, and they all told Jesus on them. Yep, there is a place for tattling. Because these threats obviously would impact these people too. So they prayed with fervency. They cared. Don't be like this guy, like the prophet in the Old Testament hiding in a cave. I'm the only one going through this. It's not true. I was this guy in high school. I had inappropriately dealt with someone who took my chair during lunch. And so he sicked the biggest guy he could find on me, and I spent my sophomore year dodging the guy. He probably wasn't around me very much. I think I only saw him two or three, four times at the most. When he'd see me, he would threaten my life, and I would run. So you imagine the 10th grade, just, you know, between classes, it was miserable. I never shared it with my family. I never prayed with anyone. I never even prayed about it. I just ran. <laughs> It was horrible. I hated being 15. <laughs> Years later, I did cross paths with a bully. Um, coming home from church, a friend and I saw this Jeep that had went, gone off the road and had flipped. And the driver was intoxicated, and he was doing his best to put it upright so he could get it back on the road. And so my friend and I got off the road, and we helped him turn it over, and it was that guy. Yeah. So I faced my fears and blessed my enemy, disarmed the threat. But I was, I was um, foolish to try to keep all that to myself. If you're truly being threatened, if you're being bullied, man, don't go through that by yourself. Do not be alienated. That's pride that'll keep you from doing that and fear keep you from doing that. And do pray with others who are also being threatened. Why? Because they will pray in agreement with you like nobody else. When they heard that, they raised their voice to God. Verse 24, with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Plug into the power of prayer. There's promises for those who pray and agree together in prayer. 
access those promises. Now, I think being a Christian really is a wise thing. It may not be the funnest thing sometimes, but it is the wisest thing. It'll keep messes out of your life. And if you go through a mess, it will help you make wise decisions. But if that's the only thing you're getting out of Christianity, you're getting ripped off. There's a word to read, promises to learn, and prayers to pray. And it's about more than you. Self-centered Christianity is not God's will. It's about the kingdom advancing in the earth. Pray in agreement with God's promises. They began quoting Psalm 2, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, against Yahweh and against his Messiah. The second Psalm goes on to say that um, they're gathered against the Lord and Christ and they're saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Let's do away with this. Let's do away with Christian influence in the land. This is happening even now. People do this, strategize together. Witches get together and have prayer meetings. So what? Look at the promise that they were accessing when they prayed this prayer. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure and say, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. It's a big prayer, big. So they were praying some heavy-duty stuff in this prayer meeting. And they prayed until they were filled with the Spirit again. Now, the number of men had grown to 5,000 plus women and children. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit those that had just become believers and those that became believers in Acts 2 and those that were filled with the Spirit at the beginning of Acts 2. They're all filled with the Spirit, either for the first time or again. To be bold witnesses. That's what they were praying. And they prayed the place where they assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. So, how do we pray? We pray with others. We pray according to God's promises. You don't have to guess what God's will is. It's written in his word. Pray biblical prayers so you're not praying your own will and asking amiss, but pray God's will. It's clear. And pray until you're filled. Pray until something happens. P-U-S-H. Push! Pray until you have a sense that God has heard And you're bold and ready to go forward in his name. Pray to your field. How many have ever ran out of gas? I used to keep, (laughs) it's a true story, I used to keep an empty gas can in the back of my truck because I didn't trust my gas gauge. You get towards E, it might be empty, it might not be empty, and a couple times it left me stranded, and I have to go buy an expensive gas can. It's missing now. I don't know who I gave it to, but um, that's dumb. Why live off the bottom of your tank when you can live off the top of your tank, right? Yeah, all all the wives say, oh, man, this is good. It applies to us all. If we live in communion with the Lord... You don't have to wait till an emergency like this springs up. You'll be ready instant, in season and out of season. Have the word of God on your lips, ready to stand in power. And finally, live out the boldness he empowers you to have. He doesn't just fill us with the spirit to have some emotional, ecstatic, religious experience. I grew up in churches like that. 
And then outside the walls of the church, we were scaredy cats. No, God empowers us for a purpose. It's not a self-centered, thrill-seeking deal, conference-chasing, wind of God, pursuing. No, it's boldness received from God, lived out in the world. Proverbs says the righteous are bold as a lion. Boldness is confidence to say and do what is right in spite of threats. These guys had to live in civil disobedience to obey the Lord. To have divine obedience, they had to disobey the authorities. That time might come in this land. It's, it's in other lands. It's illegal to be a Christian. It's illegal to witness. It's illegal to win converts, and people are thrown in prison for it. And they are empowered by the Spirit. If you don't have anything to pray for, pray for the persecuted church. Pray for believers in Iraq and Iran and China. Pray for your brothers and sisters that need God's power in their life. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that this this word would sink deep in our hearts and that if anyone here is feeling threatened or being threatened, that, Lord, we would glean a truth that would help us from this sermon today, Lord, that we would remember what you said about suffering, that we would not worry, but we would trust your spirit and we would not fear. We would be filled with your spirit and we would remember the importance of the power of the gospel and we would not isolate ourselves from people that care about us and that we would pray with others often. We would pray in agreement with your promises and pray until we're filled with your spirit again and again and again. Help us, Lord, to even pray today. Those of us that need to receive prayer, need to be prayed in agreement with, help us, Lord, to do that in this room today before we leave in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'd like to ask the prayer team to come and just join me across the front. And if you're here and you'd like to be prayed with about anything, it may not be a threat, but it is a concern. Jesus said, if two of you will agree concerning anything that they shall ask, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. So let's access the power of prayer this morning for any need you may have or need that you perceive you have or need that someone else has. Can we do that? Let's just stand. As you're standing, if you'd like to receive prayer, just come on down to the front.